Right, so you may ask, you know, why at a, tra why at a trauma course? You know, the vascular supply to the spine not only may get disrupted in the trauma, but it's part of the anatomy that we deal with every time we operate on the spine, but sometimes we don't pay as much attention to. Um, and disruption of the normal vasculature can be a source of major trauma that we inflict on the spinal cord. And, you know, just coming off of my comments at the, last, at the end of my last talk, uh, we need to have a really good sense of the anatomy so that we can be appropriately aggressive when we operate on patients. So this is a typical scenario. Uh, this is a woman that had uh, osteosarcoma uh, and, uh, who presented with an L1 metastasis. You know, you would do an unblock spondylectomy, unblock spondylectomy for resection. You know, one of the things you have to think about is you would do a 360 exposure. You have to be aware of the segmental vessels that supply the cord, especially the artery of Adamkowitz. Um, and then what do you consider for surgery? Do you do a pre-op angio to identify the blood supply? Do you do a vessel occlusion test once you identify segmental feeders? Um, you know, do the findings of any of these tests actually even change your operative approach or potentially even hinder you from completing the on-block resection? And, you know, I used a tumor case as a case example, but this could easily be a traumatic fracture, like, like the case I showed in my last talk where the patient had fractured through her vertebroplasty. Um, you know, we did a lateral approach and we had a large segmental vessel right there in front of us. So the spinal cord vasculature is overall a highly vascularized anastomotic network. It's termed the vasocorona uh, with good collateralization in the cervical and lower lumbar sacral spine. Uh, there isn't as much collateralization in the thoracic spine, and, and it's termed a watershed region, uh, which makes it susceptible to infarct. And the intricacies of these networks can vary greatly from patient to patient. And that network is in communication throughout all levels of the spine, which originate from the verts, and in some cases the pica, and run down longitudinally down the spine to the anastomotic loop uh, at the conus. And the perfusion of the spinal cord uh, function is a function of the body's mean arterial pressure and the intrathecal pressure of the CSF space. Um, so this, this might be a little dry, but I just want to make sure, you know, as I go through different studies that before we start, everybody's on the same page about a little bit of the basics of, you know, the vascular blood supply to the spinal cord. Um, so the segmental vessels, boxed in red, uh, originate from the great vessels in the neck, chest, and the abdomen. Um, and here you can see it coming off the aorta. They are usually paired, so you have one coming off the left and the right. The segmental further divides into a muscular and spinal branch, which you can see in yellow on the right. The spinal branch then further divides into the anterior and posterior radicular arteries as it travels along the nerve root. Uh, there are radicular arteries at every segment of the spine. The posterior radicular arteries form the two parallel posterior spinal arteries in green, which run longitudinally and supply the posterior one third of the cord. Most of the anterior radicular arteries terminate in a nerve root, in a dura, or in the pia, uh, where they anastomose with the posterior circulation. However, uh, a few of them will contribute to the anterior spinal artery, which is in purple, and supply the anterior two-thirds of the cord. Uh, the anterior radicular arteries that feed the anterior spinal artery are called the radiculomedullary arteries, which are labeled in pink. And the average number of radicular medullary arteries throughout the entire spine is 10. And, you know, just to know, they are not paired, which means you have one coming in either on the right or left at a level. The dominant radicular medullary artery in the thoracic and upper lumbar spine is the artery of Adankowitz, which is labeled in blue. Um, and I'm going to mainly focus on considerations for taking this during surgery. So this is a chart from a meta-analysis of over 5,400 subjects. Uh, most patients have, a, a, you know, a dominant radiculomedullary artery that is labeled as their artery of Adamkowitz, uh, most commonly found at T8 and L1 on the left. And then just to show what it looks like on spinal angio, the artery makes a hairpin turn as it goes in to supply the interior spinal artery. So here you can see an intraoperative photo uh, intradurally of the artery as it runs along the T12 nerve root. Um, so, you know, one of the concerns is that if you tie off a nerve root during a case, you could potentially be tiring, tying off the artery of Adamkowitz as well. 
Um, and the diameter of the anterior spinal artery tapers as it travels down the spine where there are less radiculomedullary arteries to supply it. You know, so we've been taught that if you ligate the artery vidamkowitz, the real issue is that the anterior spinal artery isn't getting fed and that can lead to spinal cord infarct and paraplegia. And you can see an example of that here in the MRI. Um, so where did that thought process actually come from? So the initial literature that was looking at spinal cord ischemia from vascular interruption actually came from vascular surgeons that were reporting on their experiences uh, with uh, aortic aneurysm repair. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on their studies, um, but I'll just show one of the initial studies that looked at over 1,500 patients and their, their incidence of spinal cord ischemia was 16%. Um, which they saw to correlate with aortic cross-clamp time. And their thought was that the artery of Adamkowitz was within the clamped region, and it was possibly ligated during this process, and this is what led to the spinal cord ischemia. And then another study came out and supported this claim by showing that patients with paraplegia were found in groups with the artery of Adamkowitz within the clamped region, or in cases where they weren't actually able to discern it after surgery. And then this was again echoed uh, in endovascular aortic, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, uh, where they actually showed that the stent would cover multiple levels of segmentals, which would include the artery of Adamkowitz. And uh, so if you ask a vascular surgeon, one of their biggest concerns is spinal cord injury. You know, and then spinal cord, uh, spine surgeons then went to base, you know, this, this concern during surgery based upon these vascular studies. Uh, but if we go back and we look at the equation for spinal cord perfusion, there's a few issues with the vascular surgeries that we don't see in the spine surgeries that puts, you know, those patients at risk for decreased spinal perfusion pressure. Uh, so with that in mind, we come back to the initial case. So this patient underwent a preoperative spinal angio, which showed that the artery of Adamkowitz was at L1, so at the level that they had to do the surgery. Um, they actually moved forward with the spondylectomy. They took the vessel. A uh, patient just had some mild hip flexor weakness due to L1 nerve root sacrifice. Um, you know, so what new literature has come out actually in spine surgery that made them feel comfortable enough to do this? So one of the first studies came out in the late 90s um, that was a canine study, and they were looking at radiculomedullary artery sacrifice um, when they were sacrificing a thoracic nerve root. And the authors reported that up to four unilateral nerve roots and their accompanying radicular vessels can be sacrificed without clinical evidence of spinal cord ischemia. And then in a follow-up study, also done in a canine model, the conclusion was that bilateral three-level segmental sacrifice can be completed without significant risk to the spinal cord. And so here, uh, the authors reviewed 180 total on-block spondylectomy cases, found 15 cases were up to three vertebral sacrifice, along with nerve roots and radiculomedullary arteries, including the artery of Adamkowitz, which was confirmed by angiography. And then as you can see with the Frankel score on the right, um, which is just a predecessor of the age degrading scale, where D means uh, fair to good motor function, um, where the patient can ambulate and has sensation, and E means normal uh, motor function. Uh, patients tolerated it well, which supported the findings from the canine studies. Uh, so in cases of anterior thoracolumbar spine exposure and deformity correction, approaching the curve apex from the concavity, there was this report that came out in the, the 1990s as well that showed Initially, three patients had loss of SSCPs after ligation of segmental vessels, and they had uh, post-op paralysis. Um, and so, you know, these authors went on to start a protocol where they said that they were going to do temporary clamping of the vessels with SSCP monitoring prior to ligation and to avoid ligation if there was a greater than 50% decrease in amplitude within five minutes of clamping. And after this paper came out, there were several other studies following that advocated for temporary uh, vessel occlusion prior to ligation during surgery.
until this other group came out with their larger study looking at almost 1,200 patients who underwent deformity correction, but notably the curved apex was approached from the convexity side. Uh, none of these patients had perioperative angios, and none of them underwent temporary occlusion uh, at, at all, except for one patient who had a previous surgery on the concavity side. And contrary to the title of the article, uh, there were no cases of postoperative um, paraplegia at all. Unfortunately, in the article, the authors didn't specify how many or which vessels were taken. They just said the approach ranged from T1 uh, to L3. Uh, and finally, this is a more recent study that just came out in 2020. It was a systematic review, and it looked at occlusion of the artery of Adamkowitz in segmentals. Um, the biggest issue I have with this study is that they grouped spine and vascular surgeries, which I was just telling you I don't think are very comparable. So for example, when you look at cases where the artery of Adamkowitz was included, occluded, they quoted a risk of 4%. However, that included two spine and one vascular study. There were no deficits in the spine studies. All of them came from the vascular study. And also in that vascular study, they had eight to 10 pairs of segmentals occluded by the aortic stent graft. Whereas I was just talking before about a lot of the other studies, we're looking at three to four pairs. Um, so they, they additionally showed a low risk of neurologic deficit with bilateral, unilateral, segmental sacrifice. However, when you look at a table of who had deficits, out of 12 patients total, three were spine patients. I cut out the nine vascular patients. Um, the patients that had the bilateral sacrifice made a full recovery, and the ones with the unilateral had monoplegia, um, which I question is really whether due to a vascular injury or not. You know, so my take from the literature is that if you're doing a, a spine surgery on a patient with you know a normal spinal vascular anatomy and you maintain a normal map, then you don't have to really worry about taking the artery of Damkowitz or multiple pairs of segmentals, and that's because the body has compensatory mechanisms in place for perfusion. Um, there may be collaterals from adjacent radicular arteries and or posterior spinal artery system via the peel plexus. Um, and then also uh, there may be some dynamic reversal of flow within the interior spinal artery for compensation. And so this was an article that just came out in JNS Spine that, you know, it was more of a commentary. I went back and looked at all of these previous studies. Uh, it's funny, it came out after I had given my grand rounds at, at Hopkins on this. And it, it really went into, you know, questioning those studies as well and questioning, you know, our thought process during cases when we have to make that decision. Are we going to tie this nerve root off or if we're going lateral? You know, can we afford to, to take that segmental? So if, if you're still not convinced um, and you want to know what can further be done to minimize risk, so preoperatively, you can use spinal angiography to help you with surgical planning. Um, you know, certainly there's not really time to do that when you're in a trauma case or may not be time um, to do that. Uh, depending upon what level you're operating at, the risk may be so small that it's not really worth to get the angio. You know, spinal angiography is not without its own risks. Um, Intra-op, we use monitoring anyway, but it's not perfect. It can be affected by anesthetics, and it doesn't always predict delayed postoperative, you know, paralysis. You know, you, we maintain the maps. I put greater than 90 there because in our general experience, that's what we have to tell the anesthesiologist to at least keep it above 85. Um, you know, that'll, that'll keep your perfusion pressure elevated. Uh, and if you're dealing with someone who's got, you're worried a little bit about spinal cord injury, like we were just talking, you would keep it elevated anyway. Um, and additionally, if you're decompressing the spine, that elevates the perfusion pressure. Um, I'm not really a fan of doing temporary clamping, but I think if you're very concerned about it, that's always an option that you can do. Um, and then finally, postoperatively, you can you know, maintain that equation for spinal cord perfusion pressure by maintaining your MAPS uh, elevated and keeping decreased CSF pressure. And that's it. Thanks so much for uh, that great talk. That was fantastic. Let me ask you this. Are there specific cases short of embolization that you would recommend identifying the artery of a Damkowitz in? 
You know, at, at this point, I, I don't think so. Look, looking at all of the evidence, at least for the spine surgeries that we're doing, all the studies that we've shown, it's that the amount of vessels that, you know, I can think of for any case that we would have to do would never compare to the amount that they would take for stenting, you know, or for clamping for a, a, a vascular case. And so I think that's why, even though we have this fear because of the initial data that came out in the vascular studies, it's not really something that you see, in, you know, in, in these other studies in spine patients. And I think going and doing, you know, a spinal angio has its own risks, and you need to just weigh that with the risk of hurting a patient. And I. I, I think at, at this point right now, the risk of doing that might even be in some cases higher than hurting a patient. Great, thanks. One, one other pragmatic question. When I get called by the vascular surgeons to place the lumbar drain, should I do it before they do the, the repair or should I wait and see how the patient wakes up and then do it afterwards if, if there's any evidence of paraparesis? So, I mean, I, it, it's a good question. Usually they only call us after the patient wakes up and they already have a problem. So at that point, we just go and we put the, we put the lumbar drain in. But I, I do know some vascular surgeons that ask for it before surgery as a means of, of prophylaxis. And you, you saw that, the, that equation that if you do decrease your intrathecal pressure, you can help maximize your uh, spinal cord perfusion pressure. So I think if, if they call you ahead of time and they have a reasonable concern, I would have no problem prophylactically putting a lumbar drain in. And I know we do. We just, like a, we just had a case not too long ago. I think Dr. Sassino and I uh, and Dr. Vila were involved in that. And, uh, a preemptive drain was placed in the thoracic surgery case, and the patient had a massive subdural hematoma afterwards. Yeah. Great. I mean, that, that's a whole other list of issues about how much CSF you're supposed to drain and, and that sort of thing. You, can, you can't drain too much. Any other questions? Well, great. We'll keep moving along here. Thank you so much for your time. Next up, Dr. Robbie's going to talk about.